Okay, we're back. We're live. We're back. We're live here on Think Tech Hawaii, the middle way. We're having a creative experience here at 10 o'clock in the morning in Honolulu on a given Monday. And we have our regular contributor, uh, Chang Wang, and a special guest, Jonathan Feinberg. Jonathan Feinberg is a, um, I guess he's an art historian and a critic of contemporary art. And uh, well, that's just a very limited introduction. So uh, Chang Wang is going to give him a fuller introduction. And Chang, try to try to keep it to an hour and a half, will you? Uh, I will. <laughs> that, that's a, a, a good start. And an hour and a half, that will not be enough because Professor Feinberger has published more than 30 books. And his uh, career has spent more than half a century. 21 years ago, I became Professor Feinberger's master uh, student, graduate student master program at the University of Illinois. 20, that's 21 years ago. Oh my God. And, that, and, <laughs> and he and was Professor, there at that time, right? <laughs> and Professor Feinberg and his wife, uh, Marianne Feinberg, hosted a family dinner upon my arrival. And for the next three years, I spent numerous time with professor and studying American art, uh, contemporary art and modern art. Professor Pember, in my view, is the, the best art historian in the United States. He's not only an art historian, but he's also an art critic, a curator. But most importantly, uh, he's a very prominent art educator, have, have educated thousands of thousands of art students around the world. In 2015, I had the great honor and privilege to host Professor Feinberg's first China visit and with my Almarta Beijing Film Academy. 2005. 2005. 2005. I can't yeah. believe it. That's all my time just flies. Yeah. So that was many, many years ago. And it seems, uh, but even before that, Professor Feinberg has written about Chinese contemporary art in his masterpiece, Art Since 1940, uh, the Universal Textbook on Contemporary Art. And after that, I think Professor Feinberger had built very strong relationship with the uh, uh, art community in China uh, and befriended with many, many leading and prominent Chinese artists. And, and uh, most importantly, Zhang Xiaogang. And, and I will leave this to Professor to you tell us about his friendship with Zhang Xiaogang and his uh, very important book about Zhang Xiaogang. But uh, that I, I know this uh, an hour and a half is not enough, but I know my time is limited. I will just uh, <laughs> uh, leave this back to you, Jay. Oh, thank you, Jay. Um, so, Professor, um, what would you like to correct or add to uh, from that introduction? Uh, do you want to express any rebuttal? Well, first, I want to say I wish my mother was alive to have heard it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, secondly, I want to say, you know, that um, my first trip to China was in 2005. And, um, and it was really because, you know, because of Chang Wang, who had been saying to me, you have to come visit China. And finally, when I, you know, and I'm sure he probably arranges, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think that that he probably was behind the fact that I got an invitation from the Beijing Film Academy to show a film on, uh, on 20th century American art that I had just done for uh, PBS in the US. So I thought to myself, boy, I'm, I'm definitely going. And Marianne and I got on a plane and went, and, and Wang Chang and his wife came with us. And he went every, took us everywhere. We saw so many things, and we, he translated for us everywhere we went. I mean, if it weren't for him, I probably never would have gotten <laughs> any of this, but but we be, between us we um, uh, the, I remember after showing the film which, for which he translated the subtitles, um, I came out and I found that my art since 1940 book was uh, translated into Chinese and was in huge stacks out in front of the lecture hall being sold. I had I had no knowledge of this, and <laughs> uh, but I was very happy. And and it turned out that um, that because there really isn't a lot to read. Um, all the China, all the contemporary artists had read it, so um, uh, and we were taken out by the president of the academy to a very fancy dinner. And at the end of the dinner, he said to me, "You know, I'm leaving town for for uh, for a week. 
why don't you just take my car and drive her for a week? So I thought, well, that's pretty hard to turn down. And between between that and the fact that uh, that uh, the Chung and, and Meng, his, his wife, Meng Tang, um, came with us and translated for us. And I just made a list of every uh, prominent, interesting sounding Chinese artist, contemporary artist that I could think of who lived in Beijing. And we went to every studio I, I could. And um, it was, and be, and it was a very, it was very intense. And I, um, we got some help also from Long Lin who runs Pace Beijing or was running Pace Beijing, the dealer there who kn knew everybody. And, um, and I just immediately became very much involved with the Chinese uh, art scene, which was, was and is spectacular. These are great, great artists who uh, Americans just knew no, almost nothing about. So mm -hmm. that's how that got started. But it really is uh, thanks to Wang Chung that I, that I got anywhere with that. <laughs> you know, I was there, I was there at uh, the same time. Actually, Jonathan, I was I was in uh, I had my second trip to China was right around then, and uh, we were staying at a hotel directly. You must know this place, Chang. Um, directly across the Hall of the People, this huge square. Everything is huge yeah. in China. I, I want to say the Beijing Hotel. What was it? Yes, you're right. Beijing Beijing hotel. hotel. Yep. And in the in the Beijing Hotel, the entire lobby, which was very large, was uh, dedicated to an art exhibit. And uh, I, I looked at the art and I was just astounded how good it was. It was really fabulous, world-class art. Never seen a collection like that. So I, I can relate, at least as a, as a novice, I can re relate to your delight at seeing this quality of art in China when you were first exposed to it. So how did, how did that work for you, though? Because you'd been studying art as an historian and a critic of contemporary art. And now you're faced with a whole new genre level of talent. And uh, it sounds like you kind of did a little bit of a pivot. And you, you know, you, you, took, you took it seriously and you, you, you wrapped your, your artistic and art critic thinking around it. And it's been that way ever since. Am I right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been pivoting my whole life because I never know enough. So you know, <laughs> what, what happens? But, you know, this will be on the final exam, by the way. Anybody <laughs> watching the show, it's going to be on the final. <laughs> but, you know, I, I did a book called Art since 1940, Strategies of Being, which was the standard. It was, uh, Chang was talking about this. It was the standard book for 25 years. And, uh, and I, I um, uh, updated it about every five years because it's art since 1940, which means there's always new things happening. And I'm always trying to uh, catch up to what, you know, where the last play landed, basically. And um, at a certain point, um, I, I, actually very recently, I took it out of print because I wanted to redo that as a three volume 20th century. And I've been thinking about the, the problem, you know, of, of our perspective on this. So the first part of it is really um, focused on Europe and America uh, as, uh, and the tradition of the avant-garde, which was exclusive to Europe and America. And then from about 1914 to 1970, um, you have the kind of apotheosis of this, but you suddenly begin to get the influence of, uh, of other cultures in this. Um, first, people didn't realize how many other cultures are in America. Um, and that was one of the revelations of, of the first part of this. But, uh, but after 1970, it became a global issue and the avant-garde in a way became moot. And so, and I'm really rethinking that right now as I do this last volume of that three-volume uh, book, which would have, would have otherwise been the update of the art since 1940, will now be a 20th century art book. But, but you know, it's made me think a lot about, um, you know, how our frame of reference has changed. And certainly uh, one of the things that impacted that was seeing this Chinese art, because um, I realized that um, from about 1980, when the very first um, graduates of the reopened art academies in China after the Cultural Revolution, there was a generation of artists who had been waiting for 10 years to get into an art school, and they were or it was already very competitive. So the kind of level of students that they had were, was extraordinary. And there's brilliant people came out of that, and, and they, in a way, engendered a whole Chinese art scene that was like, I felt like I was watching the Italian Renaissance unfold, because there were so many talented people um, and of such high quality, and they were so well informed and well read. 
Um, and it was just, it was a revelation and I continue to be uh, fascinated by what they do. Well, let me let me take a moment and ask uh, Chang a question, you know. Um, what does art mean to the people in China? I'm gonna ask you what it means to the people in the United States in a little while, Jonathan. Uh, what does it mean to the people in China? I mean, I'm thinking of Ai Weiwei, an artist, right? But he's also a political person. Is there a connection? Uh, is it popular? What do people, you know, do people make the connection? Do they see it as a, a political statement or, or do they see it in some other way? Is it, is it inherent, inherent in the Chinese culture? Well, let me uh, uh, respond. It's a very uh, profound question and require a very uh, complicated answer, but let me respond to you by saying that. Ai Weiwei is probably the most uh, well-known Chinese artist in the world, but the least known Chinese artist in China because of his <laughs> political activities. So he's, uh, he, he's not very well known in China. But in, in, to answer the main part of your question, what does art mean to Chinese people? And, and art today is a profession, it's an industry, it's a, it's a discipline. It's highly specialized and it's professionalized uh, you know, uh, arena. So they are uh, the, the lay people and the understanding of art, which means you know, something they can appreciate, something they can go to, uh, uh, a museum and to, to see it, and or something they uh, read from a textbook the, the, about you know the traditional Chinese art history things like that. But there are a, a separate, if if you may, the separate world of the art world. That means uh, the art uh, historian and critic like Professor Fanberg, the curators, and the pretty active artists. Those people formed a, a, a kind of separate community from the rest of the lay people, and they are they, they have there are certain rules and there are certain protocols in this community. In you know, I'm community. I'm looking at the uh, the screen behind you in your room there, mm -hmm. your office, what the case may be, and I'm saying hmm, that's you know traditional Chinese screen painting. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's actually Japanese. Japanese, okay. <laughs> that's, that's Japanese, well, but this is the what I call. Me. <laughs> this is what I call. Well, my uh, my lady point lady. is that what I saw in the Beijing Hotel, completely yeah. different, completely different, and um, you know, true. it wasn't traditional at all. It was modern art. It was exactly. It was, exactly. Yeah. Let me let me exactly. go back to uh, Jonathan for a moment, Jonathan. Um, the people in the United States, you know, and the culture, call it the culture, which everybody's been studying the last few years, examining the culture of the United States. Where, where does art fit in it? And is it in an appropriate place uh, for the, the, you know, the, the citizens of the United States to appreciate it? Or, or have we not given it enough attention? You know, works of art are, first of all, every artist is different. Um, and I don't even think, you know, we think we look at Chinese art and it's a, it's a collection of extraordinary individuals, but I wouldn't say that there's one relation that, that in China they have to their own people and their own art. You know, Ai Weiwei is, of course, very famous here, but, you know, you don't look at Ai Weiwei because of the character, the object so much as his political um, uh, acumen and his, his kind of brilliance at characterizing that relationship. You know, some of the other artists, and, and of course, as a result of that, the Chinese government wants nothing to do with him. But the, um, but the other um, artists like Zhang Zhaogang is, is not so overtly political. Um, and he is very well known in China, don't you think, Zhang? I mean, he's, oh, yeah. he's, he's very famous in China. Um, and, um, and he is, to my mind, I would say he's China's greatest painter right now. Uh, but there are others also of extraordinary quality. And you know what's interesting about a work of art ultimately is that it's a it's a way of uh, mediating your experience of reality, and you know and it's always changing. You know the definition of art nobody's ever been able to come up with a definition of art because it's always changing. It's always about it's always uh, it's the totality of everything that we think is art, and that's constantly evolving because society and problems are evolving, and we need a way to. Uh, to organize our relationship to it. I, you know, I'll tell you, I think it's always, uh, I love the, the, the idea of, 
uh, a metaphor of a marriage because you know when you, when you marry somebody you fall in love with somebody it's very disorganized you know it's, uh, you have somebody else suddenly coming in coming into your very private spaces of your life uh, doing things um, in that space that are sometimes quite disconcerting and you put up with it because you love them and there's so many gratifications in the relationship but you're you're being disorganized and you're being reorganized have you been talking to my wife at all <laughs> so Jonathan, what, what, now you've been writing about creativity. You've taken this, right. you know, from art, um, you know, uh, criticism uh, and uh, the study of contemporary art to creativity. This is really important. One of the shows we do here on Think Tech is the American uh, Creativity Association, believe it or not, out of Texas. Um, but I just wonder, you know, why you did that and what it means to you and how it differs from you know, your, I guess, your initial phase in this business uh, as a, an art historian and critic? Well, I've always been interested in this problem because I think that um, a great work of art disorganizes you like a relationship. You know, um, if you really are moved by it, it's a little disturbing. And at the same time, it gives you an opportunity with no consequences to reorganize yourself. And you're reorganizing yourself in relation to an artist experience of reality which is usually very sharp and so that's why i'm so interested in christo he's another artist who does this you know uh, if you want to put up one of those why don't you put up a couple of those pictures yeah let's go through our picture show here let's, so we'll let's, take okay you tell us what these are now jonathan okay so that's an early that's one of christo's very early um styles of work he you just start wrapping packaging things and you have no idea what's inside it's sort of mystery um, it looks very ordinary. You first look at it and you think it's not a work of art at all, which is, of course, every great work of art begins as not being art until it redefines the concept of art to include itself. Um, and that's what the avant-garde tradition is all about. But go to go to the next crystal. Let's see what else you've got there. So that's a project that he did in um, just a couple of years ago. It was the, the last project he finished before, or one of the last projects he finished before he died. That was uh, 2016. Um, and he, he, he built a walkway that goes across Lake Isio in Italy. So you're walking across water. And it's a long walk from the, from the mainland to these islands, which are otherwise inaccessible except by boat. And uh, he, he put this up only for, uh, for two weeks. And it cost millions of dollars, uh, all of which he raised from the sale of his drawings. It pays for everything himself because it's all about being free as an artist. And one of the things it does is it makes you, you're in this, uh, and you're having this surreal experience in reality. And it makes you rethink everything that you're seeing, including everything you are and you do. Um, and that's what works of art do. They, they give you this opportunity to kind of rethink your, your, your way of organizing yourself in relation to reality. So that was an amazing project because you you walk over that and you could feel the water and you know it uh, it was just it was one of the most inspiring things. See what else is on there for Chris? Is there other Christo? There's one that he did in Miami that was um, uh, that was in 1983. It was called the Surrounded Island, and he went into the uh, Biscayne Bay in Miami and he put a 250 foot wide skirt around um, 11 of the 14 islands in the Biscayne Bay. Again, only for two weeks because once you know, once it's been up for a while, he takes it away. So you have to imagine it, and and the reality of it is what's in your mind. It's not what's in the, you know, what's actually physically there. You don't want to get. He doesn't want it to be reified. So, but there again, you know, it's all about the reality of the situation. You know, the colors are very much inspired by the real the real environment. Everybody's having to do their job. You know, the, the Marine Patrol is still patrolling the bay and directing traffic, but now they're doing it in relation to this completely irrational thing. Uh, and it makes them think about it again. And I had, when that was up, I went around interviewing all these people and I had amazing conversations with these people. You know, one of the Marine Patrol guys said to me, you know, I've been patrolling the Biscayne Bay on a boat for, for years and on, on the weekend, the holiday weekends, you know, we have all these accidents and it's a disaster. And he said, there's more traffic out looking at this project right now than any holiday I've ever patrolled. And there hasn't been a single accident. So, you know- well, let, me, let me take a moment and, uh, and make myself a, an observer of this, yeah. okay? So okay. I see this and I see this uh, pink, <laughs> pink, of course, flamingo pink, call it that, okay? Right. Has something right. to do with Florida. 
um, and and, um, and it, it's it's it around the island. So you say this makes you think. Now I'm I'm not a sophisticated uh, art uh, you know uh, art person, um, but what it makes me think is um, you know there, it's like a soup. It's like there's um, it's <laughs> sorry, it's maybe borscht, kind of a a, a pink colored borscht, uh, and it makes me think of the water and the this island is special. But why is the artist doing this? What is he trying to tell me? And I, I suppose I would come up with some ideas about what he might be conveying. Is this the right approach? Sure, sure. I mean, I think that everybody, you know, there. Um, it's like John Cage said about the first uh, event that he organized at Black Mountain College in 1953. He said, every seat is the best seat because it's your seat. And you know, and the point with this is that this will this will go away. But you know, no matter how you experience this, and Christo said this, you know, it doesn't matter whether you see this in a book in a library in Denver or whether you actually were there and watched it happen or you saw it in television. Everybody has a reality of this project in their head, um, and it's their experience of it that really matters, and it's what it does in terms of their relationship to to reality. So how do you how do you rate this? In other words, um, if everyone has a different view of it, a, a different reaction to it, a different kind of set of questions about it, how do you rate a good piece of art, contemporary art, against the not so good piece? What's the metric? Is there a metric? I'm I'm really asking you about art criticism. Right. So the metric for me would be um, how much how much did it affect how many people. Um, and I think that, you know, when you think about um, that project we were just looking at in Miami, I mean, there's probably other, other go ahead and see if one of the pictures well, are in there. Let's see some others. We can put them in the same context. Yeah, there's another one of, the, I think, of the Pont Neuf and Paris. Oh, this one, so this one right now is about to happen. September 18th uh, the, will be the last Crystal project that he's completely organized himself. His studio is going to put it up. He's going to wrap the Arc de Triomphe in Paris for two weeks. And that's what you're seeing as a, as a, a collage that he made. Um, and uh, in each case, you know, um, uh, well, I think about the, I was thinking about the Marine Patrol guy, but the, another conversation I had in Miami with somebody was I went to a little Havana one night for dinner while the project was up. And I said to um, the waiter, and I said, did you go see the project? And he said, no, he said, put his thumbs down. He said, no good. And I said, really, did you see it? And he said, no, I didn't see it. But my son went over there, drove over the causeway, and he said he couldn't see anything. And I said, well, I said, well, did you see it on television? Because it was on the front page of newspapers all over the world. It was on the Miami Herald was on the front page every day for weeks. It was on television. He said, so I said, did you see it on television? And his face lit up. He said, oh, yeah, it was fantastic. And it was like we were talking about two different, completely different realities. Um, and you know, with the with this Arc de Triomphe, so, you know, I, I started talking about the about the um, that project in Italy. You know, which was the the floating piers was in the middle of nowhere. It was a hundred degrees heat, and 1.2 million people found their way to come see that in the first weekend. And this project, I bet you're going to have three million people show up for this. And is it is it because I mean there's got to be a, a factor of public relations in this too? Is it because they are you know curious and because it provokes them because they have lots of questions about it they want to make some some sense out of it and or is it also a function of seeing it on the front page of hearing critics talk about it of seeing public public relations campaigns about it? Uh, both factors I'm sure are at play, but how do they work together? All of all of the above and more. So you know I mean, that's absolutely right. But I mean they, they don't. Uh, Christo never um, engaged in public relations. It was just people reported on them and talked about them and experienced them in different ways. And in order to get them built, he would do a drawing like I just showed you for the um, for the Arc de Triomphe, and it looks so real. You you look at it and you feel like he's really going to do this. And that builds the momentum in people's minds, and then they start talking about it, and that momentum carries it forward. And when you start to think about the fact that in Paris, you've engaged, you know, uh, three million people in the building of a work of art, what other work of art does that? You know, you got three, mil three million people who are so curious about this, and so, and they want to come see it, and they're, 
and it, when it's gone, they remember it, and there's conversations that go on forever about it. So that's very important. Um, and I'll tell you what my my model there really. Um, when I was a student, when I was a college student, one of the uh, one of my professors was a man named Eric Erickson. I don't know if you, if you know who he was, but he was a psychoanalyst who wrote a book called Gandhi's Truth, and he wrote Young Man Luther and other books. And what he what he what he said is that Gandhi and these other people thought were were people with with uh, psychological issues that they sorted out um, in a dynamic way. But they did it in public, and their issues were were enough related to other people that they became ideology. So you know, Gandhi became the founder of a new nation by, in one sense, founding a solving a problem for himself that everybody could relate to. And I think that's what uh, that's one of the models for a great work of art. A lot in that. Can we? Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Can we talk a little about the Art Museum uh, of Philadelphia? Let's put a picture of the front of it up. So, so what, the, what is it and how does it bear on the scene and exactly okay, so why did you the, select that place to do your work? Well, the, um, I have um, studied psychoanalysis and I began to study neuroscience because I really wanted to understand what happened in the brain when creativity takes place. And I think I got to the place where I could actually teach it um, because I understood enough about the dynamics. And just at that point, I wrote a book called Modern Art, The Border of Mind and Brain. And I was asked by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Engineering and Medicine to talk about that last chapter. And I met a guy there who, was, uh, who I thought was brilliant. We had this wonderful conversation. I had no idea who he was. And I happened to say to him, you know, I retired from the Board of Trustees, the Phillips and the, and the University of Illinois, and all these things, and I'm going to move. I don't know where I'm going to go. I'm, you know, my age, I better do it now if I'm going to do it. So he said, well, and I, and I said, I'm thinking about Philadelphia. He said, well, that's really funny because I've just been appointed the new president of the University of the Arts. Why don't you come and have dinner with me if you're coming to look at real estate? So we get there and over <laughs> dinner, basically, he said, you described the process of, of being able to teach creativity. I'm, I'm, I'm the new president here. This is an art school. Um, and what we really are interested in is advancing human creativity. And he rewrote the mission statement for the university is simply advancing human creativity. So why don't you create a PhD program for me that does that? So that's how I ended up here. Oh, that's and great. The, what a great yeah. life, you know. Have, have, you made, have you made tons of money in trading art? Oh, never. <laughs> that, <laughs> worry is that the goal within the <laughs> job description of a, a critic and an historian? You go up to 57th Street in Manhattan and buy and sell expensive art? Well, the, my problem is that, you know, I, I'm given often great things, and sometimes I've even bought a few things, but I can never sell them. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't part with them. And so that's my problem. I'll, I'll never be a great capitalist because of that. <laughs> so what's your advice to people in general? I, I would limit it to students, but I don't think I should limit it. What, what is your advice to people in general about how to relate to art, how to have that special transcendental experience with art uh, to enrich their lives. You, you know, you just want to have an open mind. Again, it's like meeting somebody, having a relationship. You're looking at, you go, go into a museum and find that one thing that speaks to you and really look at it, you know, and ask yourself, you know, um, what, uh, what it elicits. I think your reaction to that project is perfectly, that's the way to go. You know, you ask yourself, how do you feel about this? What does it remind you of? Where does it take you? What is it, you know, what's challenging about it? What, what don't you like? Because often what you don't like turns out to be the most important thing. <laughs> uh, uh, Chang, let's, let's go to you for a minute now. Now it's clear to me uh, from this brief discussion that Jonathan Feinberg's life has been affected by the gift you gave him of things <laughs> Chinese. But my yeah. question is the other way around now. After all these years, you still know each other. You still relate, and you still observe the work of the other and so forth. How has Jonathan Feinberg's work and your relationship with him changed your life? Everything. And uh, <laughs> let me first correct you that to, uh, I, I took the credit to, to host Professor Feinberg's one of his visits to China, but that uh, it, it's just that he's a small part of it is his entire China adventure, and definitely an even smaller part of this very broad academic, you know, uh, uh, world. But uh, uh, 
talk about Professor Pemberg's influence on me is uh, Professor Pemberg is he, he mentioned open uh, mind, he mentioned creativity. And in, I have categorized people into two basic big categories. One category is people, they don't know, they don't know. And you know what, who I'm talking about. <laughs> and then another category is the people <laughs> do know what we don't know. That's you, Jay, Professor Feinberg, and me. But we, for the second category, we keep an open mind. And we keep trying to understand and learn the things we don't know. And we understand no matter how hard we try, there are still a lot of things we don't know. But that keep us humble and keep us being creative and keep us being open-minded. That is the biggest thing I learned from Professor Thunberg for the past 21 years. And I look forward to continue, continue to learn from him. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you for introducing us to Jonathan Feinberg and discussing this, uh, this really interesting subject. And let me say that um, one thing I know, whether I do know that I know it or I don't know that I know it, is that we have only touched the surface of your life and study and what you, what you teach. And Jonathan, I'm frustrated beyond description that we only scratch the surface. We can spend so much more time uh, examining your work and your perception of things that I'm frustrated that we haven't. We haven't done we will, that. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll we should, maybe should come back. Yeah. We yes. should come back and we should go I'd much deeper. You know? Definitely. I'd love to agree. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to meet you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Shank. Thank you. I'll see you okay. soon. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.